Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tehami. The United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, while speaking at the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly, has said climate change is not a change of weather. It is uh, killing people and devastating uh, communities. Every continent, every region, and every country is feeling the heat, but I am not sure uh, whether all the leaders are feeling that heat. He has also said G20 countries happen to be responsible for 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And he has also urged them to break down their addiction on fossil fuels. The Secretary General also called for ensuring climate justice for those countries and communities vulnerable to climate change and uh, who did least to cause the crisis but are paying the highest price uh, from this climate change happening in the world all across. Also, United Nations Secretary General will be hosting a very important moot related to climate change that has been titled as Climate Ambition Summit. And only those leaders who have made a concrete plan regarding achieving net zero greenhouse emissions would be allowed to speak. And out of these 41 speakers happens to be the caretaker, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Anwarul Haq Kakar, also, earlier uh, we know uh, that taking uh, the podium of the United Nations 78th session of the General Assembly, U.S. President Joe Biden referenced natural disasters as part of a snapshot that tells the urgent story of what awaits us if we fail to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and begin to climate-proof the world. In today's program, uh, we'll be uh, discussing the urgency to act now uh, regarding uh, climate change, the salient points of the United Nations Secretary General address and the related points to climate change, also the likely outcomes of this important moot that has been titled as the Climate Ambition Summit, also uh, the responsibility of the leading economies and the major emitters uh, regarding phasing out the fossil fuel projects. For that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Dr. Abbas Musavi, his research fellow, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Dr. Musavi, thank you very much for your time, for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. On Skype at the same time, we are being joined by Dr. Asif Javed. He's an environmentalist. Uh, Dr. Asif Javed, thank you very much for your time also, for being with us on Views on News tonight. We really appreciate that. Let me begin the discussion with you, Dr. Musavi, uh, just uh, for the general understanding, starting from the very basics. Uh, how do you relate uh, economy with the environment or the climate change for the general uh, understanding for our viewers? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to start off by highlighting the political economy perspective on this matter. Uh, I think it's important to approach climate change from a multidisciplinary sort of perspective. Uh, it, which includes things like environmental science, but also economics, uh, particularly environmental economics, as well as political science. I think it's important to adopt a multi-pronged approach to this problem. Uh, on the issue of climate change, uh, there's this great study by uh, Professor Jason Hickel, um, who conducted the study which demonstrated that 92% of carbon emissions uh, since 1989 have actually come from the global north. Uh, the Global North constitutes um, the U.S., Canada, um, Europe, Israel, and New Zealand and Australia. 92% of emissions are coming from these regions of the world. And I think it's very important to acknowledge this when we think about solutions because uh, I feel like in today's uh, policy analysis or commentary, there seems to be a high level of emphasis on mitigation strategy. But I think purely focusing on that and not looking at the power dynamics that shape the sector, that shape the climate uh, industry, uh, which uh, primarily includes uh, the global fossil fuel industry in particular, I think would be a big mistake, right? So I think it's important to approach this from a, from, from a point of view that appreciates the power dynamics of the sector. Um, so uh, having said that, I think uh, for countries like Pakistan, if they want to begin to address the problem, uh, one of the first things to do is to adopt a comprehensive approach which has to be led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in particular uh, to collaborate with other countries in the region which include uh, most saliently our South Asian neighbors, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and so on, but also countries in uh, Africa uh, because these are the countries that are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Uh, this is a common area of mutual collaboration that can be pursued. 
Uh, I think it's very important to do that. I think it's uh, important to also look at uh, our colonial uh, legacy. There's this great study that demonstrates that about 45 trillion USD were actually extracted from uh, the subcontinent uh, during colonial times. And I think it's important to leverage that fact, that reality of our historical trajectory, and to actually push for uh, climate reparations and not just the mitigation strategies. It's important to look at power dynamics when we're looking for solutions through these big international platforms, such as the, the COP27, 28 this year, uh, we should appreciate uh, the fact that uh, uh, most of our assistance uh, is currently coming in the form of further indebtedness. It's coming in the form of further loans, further credit, and this ultimately has to be paid by the ordinary person. Uh, the elite capture that takes place within these domains is uh, quite sky high, and uh, it's important to move from that approach to an approach that is based more on wa uh, debt waivers and the easing of debt burdens on Pakistan rather than the other way around. Right. Uh, you already mentioned there is a study uh, that alludes to the fact 92% of the emissions come yes. from the global north. Yes. So uh, we see uh, the kind of devastating uh, impacts mm -hmm. the global south is uh, facing because yes. of the 92% uh, emissions from the global north. Mm -hmm. So that, us, uh, that makes us to conclude uh, that it is the global south which is uh, paying the price yes. for what has been done by Global North, a clear, clear cut yes. divide. Yes, so uh, in that regard, mm -hmm. the urgency which has been talked about repeatedly yes. by the United Nations Secretary General mm -hmm. uh, holds water. Of course it does. Extent. Of course it does. I'm actually very appreciative of what the Secretary General has been uh, saying, uh, in, in, uh, particularly in the past two years or so, because he has begun to appreciate the sort of power dynamics and the historical details that have shaped uh, the situation that we currently find ourselves in globally. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Asif, uh, what's your understanding regarding uh, the kind of uh, uh, remarks which have been given by the United Nations Secretary General during his address at the 70 years United Nations General Assembly session regarding uh, climate change and the urgency to act now and climate change doesn't happen to be a change of weather, it is actually killing people and devastating communities. Mr. Asif Javed, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you, please. Go ahead. How do you understand uh, the remarks, the kind of urgency that has been expressed by the United Nations Secretary General uh, during his address at the 78th session of UNGA uh, related to climate change? Uh, well, thank you, Jawad, for our kind of uh, Actually, the United Nations Secretary General and Daniel Bassis clearly mentioned that the world has changed, but our institutions have not changed. That's a very important remarks of the United Nations Secretary General in terms to fight a climate change problem. He clearly said that this is not only this is the problem, this, uh, climate change basically possesses the existential threats to the community, and we have to change ourselves. And uh, he also showed concern that developed world is not that much serious as uh, required by them. As you, you see that there are 10.9 billion rupees, a uh, billion dollars are pledged for Pakistan in the Geneva Flood uh, Summit. So out of this 10.9 billion, only 1.48 billion has been actually released to Pakistan. So you can see the serious, I can say this is a very meaningless amount compared to what actually have been pledged. And out of those 1.48 billion, 600 million dollars have been actually provided by the Saudi Arabia for oil and gas. So this is, this shows the seriousness of the world. So what good sign is that United Nations is taking an interest in its pushing the United, uh, it pushing the, you know, technically advanced country uh, towards uh, fulfill their pledges. So all these things. So I think it will have a very positive impact on the, you know, uh, on the developed world in helping out the poor nations or developing world. Or in other words, we can see a global south. Our prime minister is in uh, New York, so definitely he's going to attend some important meetings in a near uh, in two days maybe or maybe tomorrow, like for example, financing for development. So this, this is going to be an opportunity. He has to play a smart role to tap out the resources from these you know, the technically advanced countries so that it, uh, the amount can be not only be pledged, but also sent to the Pakistan for the development. Yes, Jawad. Right, Mr. Mr. Asif Javed, uh, uh, I would request you to hold for a second because uh, the kind of uh, thing that you've just mentioned regarding the pledges uh, after the devastating floods back in uh, summer 2022 over here in Pakistan, the kind of pledges uh, the international community uh, has made towards Pakistan, those pledges happen to be in the form of uh, 
loans, although a very little amount uh, as to what had been pledged in that particular conference uh, uh, has been received so far, uh, but that pledge uh, happens to be in the form of loans. So when we talk about uh, those countries which have been uh, severely impacted by the adverse impacts of climate change, do you think uh, making a pledge in the form of loans itself is justified for a country which has paid uh, uh, the heavy price in the form of the devastating impacts of climate change because of the wrongdoing of the major powers. Yes, Jawad, I totally agree. Yes, I, I would say no. This is not a fair uh, thing to do, but particularly for in the glo global south like for Pakistan, obviously because we became the victim of their wrongdoing. So this is, they, they're not supposed to give us a loan. They, are, they, they have to compensate in terms of, you know, donations or something like that. This is their ethically and moral responsibility to support this part of the world who has been badly suffered by extreme climate is like floods and droughts and all those things. So definitely, but the thing is, things are on a positive direction because United Nations and US President Joe Biden is quite serious about all these things. And initially, I, I mentioned the United States because the United States is the big emitter of the greenhouse gases after the China. So definitely he has to play a major role in that. And so definitely, I, I, I hope uh, with the passage of time, all these uh, you know, loan will be you know, uh, something like change into the, uh, you can say like donation or something like that by the developed nations. Uh, right, I'll come back to you to take a detailed view regarding the seriousness of the U.S. side when it comes to uh, 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 taking uh, concrete measures in order to uh, address uh, the adverse impacts of climate change. Now, uh, Dr. Musvi, is it justified uh, for the major powers to make pledges for a country most vulnerable that leads, um, contributes the least to the greenhouse gas emissions in the form of loans? Uh, of course not. Um, I think an important point to uh, realize over here is that uh, countries and foreign relations in particular are all going to be based on self-interest of countries. And I think uh, if the Global South doesn't unite or isn't able to un unite for trivial differences among themselves and realize that this is something that uh, impacts all of them collectively, uh, particularly their most vulnerable uh, segments of their populations, their respective populations. And I, thi uh, I think if that never happens, if we aren't able to uh, put forth a consolidated sort of argument that uh, argues against further indebtedness, further loans, then I think it's only going to exacerbate the problem going forward. I think it's important for all countries, all stakeholders to sit with one another, uh, put, uh, set, setting aside their differences, setting aside their uh, geostrategic differences for the time being and realizing that climate change is something that is going to impact each and every single one of them in a disproportionate manner going forward. I think that's very important. Right, uh, so uh, uh, these pledges were made in the climate mm -hmm. uh, resilient mm -hmm. person in Geneva. I, mm -hmm. Is it uh, some sort of uh, different uh, sort of a pledge mm -hmm. from uh, what Pakistan can actually capitalize mm -hmm. from when we talk specifically of the loss and damage fund, mm -hmm. which would be materialized in the upcoming COP28? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think when it comes to policy uh, on climate change or policy in general, I think it's very important to look at our institutional arrangements. Our institutions were never reformed after our independence in a sub significant, substantial way. Our institutions are all very prone to elite capture to this day, uh, particularly in certain key domains such as the civil services, such as the energy sector in particular, uh, the social sector, which includes uh, social protection, housing, health care, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's important to look at uh, the sort of mechanisms, the managerial dynamics, the internal incentive structures of our institutions if we want for whatever policy it is that we're pursuing to actually uh, reach our intended end consumer. Right? Because otherwise, if we don't look at how our institutions are functioning, then resources are going to continue to be embezzled by whoever it is that happens to have the most authority within those domains. I think that's very important to understand and realize and acknowledge there has to be political will. We naturally have to address our own domestic issues. First and foremost, if we want to come up with uh, effective policy that is geared to promoting the interests, the desires, to addressing the grievances of our ordinary citizenry, which most saliently includes the working classes in particular. Uh, I think um, uh, in terms of our mitigation strategies, it's, more, it's important to talk about the dynamics of the energy sector. Now the energy sector, uh, the 1994 power policy of Pakistan, 
Uh, it's important to look at the sort of salient uh, details of that. Uh, w what that policy did was basically it invited international power producers to come in to Pakistan to set up shop and they, they were made a promise by the government of Pakistan that we will take care of the cost of logistics, the cost of setting up. But on top of that, we will guarantee a rate of return which was about well, 15 uh, to 18 uh, percent. Um, yeah. I get your point. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll come back to you sure, to sure. understand how basically mm -hmm. Pakistan can capitalize on mm -hmm. uh, what uh, the loss and damage fund actually mm -hmm. promises in sure. future in the upcoming uh, COP28. Uh, sure. uh, let me bring another participant in the show, Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam, environment lawyer, You're joining us on the phone line. Uh, Mr. Alam, thank you very much for your time for being with us on Views on News tonight. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about climate justice as has uh, repeatedly and continuously been uh, talked about by uh, the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres himself, how uh, basically climate justice can be done? What's required for that? Well, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, one way of framing climate justice is looking at the unprecedented floods that Pakistan experienced last year. There's an attribution science study conducted by Imperial College London last year that determined that about 50% of the intensity of the rainfall over Sindh and Balochistan, and we're talking 400 to 800% of monthly averages over the course of a few days, was directly attributable to the 1.1, 1.2 degrees of global warming that we've experienced since the Industrial Revolution. So make no mistake, the 30 million Pakistanis that were affected by the floods last year, the 10 million Pakistanis that were displaced, were not displaced because of a natural phenomenon. They were displaced because of the greenhouse gas emissions of countries and economies in the global north. The people of Pakistan had no responsibility, yet they faced and suffered on account of the climate crisis created somewhere else. That is the framing of climate justice, and Pakistan is not alone. It's a poster child for climate justice. There are literally over 100 countries around the world that are facing the brunt of the climate crisis. We've seen in the course of just the past few weeks unprecedented flooding in China, in Beijing, in Hong Kong, uh, in Greece, where nearly 30% of the country was inundated. And of course, the tragedy that unfolded in the Libyan city of Darna, where overnight, because of floods associated with Hurricane Andrew, cost over 10,000 lives in one night. So these are the impacts of climate change that are directly attributable to the greenhouse gas emissions of the global north. We have, uh, under the arrangements of the United Nations, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which, of course, makes it obligatory on larger countries to mitigate their greenhouse gases and for less developed countries to adapt to the changes that climate change will bring. But implicit in the United Nations framework is the promise of climate finance from larger economies to less developed economies so that less developed economies can not just adapt to climate change but also mitigate their own greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we are failing. The international community is failing. The global north has failed in mitigating its greenhouse gases. And now scientists tell us that the 1.5 degrees promise of the Paris Agreement in other words, that this world would not experience more than 1.5 degrees of global warming this century, is going to be breached by the end of this decade, which is less than seven years from now. And we're already beginning to see incredible rain and flooding in Pakistan, heat waves and drought, which affect crop productivity, and of course, risk to humans in large urban settlements. The World Bank in its last country uh, climate report uh, published earlier this year suggests that nearly 18 to 20 percent of Pakistan's GDP will be dragged down by the impacts of climate change. Now, Pakistan is already in financial crisis, and uh, without proper international support, not just Pakistan, but countries similarly facing the brunt of the climate crisis will not be able to get on their feet and be able to provide for their people until a loss and damage facility or some sort of climate facility or some sort of finance facility is available. Let me point out that this money is available. It's available for war in Ukraine. It's available for war in Afghanistan. It's available to restore the uh, Notre Dame church when it's burnt to the ground. But it's not available to Pakistan. The availability of that money, I seek your pardon for the interjection. So the availability 
of, of that money happens to be of crucial importance of world, uh, countries uh, such as Pakistan, uh, which happens to be most vulnerable to climate change and its adverse impact. So in what form ideally that money should be available? Should it ideally be available in form of loans as it's uh, been the pledges? in the climate resilient Pakistan, the pledge is made by the international community, or should it be coming in form of some sort of aid or reparations? Of course not loans. Loans and this sort of usury has through cultures and religions been forbidden. Look, when people are down and on their knees, you don't make them more indebted. You give them grants, especially when the cause of their, of their pain is your responsibility. The climate finance that is a promise of the United Nations framework convention on climate change is more and more looking like reparation. It's unfortunate, however, that the international financial architecture is not looking at it this way. We are continuing to be laden with more and more loans instead of the grants and aid we need to be able to support our economies so that our people and our economies can face the brunt of the climate crisis. Right, uh, Mr. Alam. Now, you already mentioned uh, the leading emitters, the major economies have actually failed to cut down the emissions. What major reasons do you think uh, were the uh, causes uh, that these leading emitters couldn't cut down on their emissions? Well, let me put it to you quite simply. It's profit. Okay, last year, when the floods ravaged Pakistan, the World Bank estimated Pakistan suffered between 30 to $34 billion worth of infrastructure loss. Yet at the same time, the Shell Corporation posted an annual profit of $34 billion. Saudi Aramco, one of the largest companies in the world that deals in fossil fuel, posted a profit of $160 billion. This is the stark, what's the word, uh, hypocrisy of the international financial system that allows fossil fuel polluters to bring this earth to civilizational collapse, to continue to make profits and money when people around the world are suffering the impacts of climate change. This has to change. So this has to, of course, change. And that is what we see. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General continuously talks about his hosting the Climate Ambition Summit. Uh, do you think uh, it is easily doable when such a huge profit is also of concern for the uh, corporations uh, phasing out the fossil fuels and going for the renewable energy? At one point, slavery was legal. Tigaji, it was perfectly legal. We need to change the legal system, and Pakistan can lead the charge through negotiations. Pakistan is a poster child of how people can be impacted by climate change caused by somewhere else. There are other countries in the United Nations system the vulnerable countries, the small island states that Pakistan can join and leverage and bring to block so that it can negotiate hard with the G20 countries to force them to fulfill their promises of phasing out fossil fuels as quickly as possible and by 2050. Okay, but uh, don't you think there would naturally be an opposition from these corporations, a couple of them uh, which you have already also mentioned? Indeed, with the amount of profit that they're making. But do remember, cigarette companies were making profits and denying the science of the impacts of smoking on lung cancer. Similarly, these fossil fuel companies are lying when they deny the connection between their business and the civilizational collapse that we will inevitably face unless governments around the world rein those profits in. There's money to be made in sustainability. There's money to be made in resilience. There's money to be made in renewable energies. We mustn't let these oligarchs, these billionaires, continue to determine our future. So what is the practical way forward? Negotiate, leverage. At all points, Pakistan should be leveraging its position and its experience, raising its voice, bringing allies on board so that when we go to the negotiating table at COP in Dubai in November, we have partners with us that can force an argument, can force these corporations to back down. It's a difficult challenge, but it has to be done because this world has no other alternative. Mr. Ahmed uh, Rafi Alam, environment lawyer, joining us on the phone line. Thank you very much for being with us on the show tonight, really.
appreciate uh, that. Dr. Asif, uh, you earlier talked about the seriousness of the United States, which happens to be one of the leading emitters of the greenhouse uh, emissions. Uh, we know the Climate Ambition Summit is to be hosted by United Nations Secretary General. Uh, we don't see the United States giving the podium this time around out of 41 speakers. So the U.S. is not going to speak on this very important moot. What does that primarily depict? What, what, uh, what do you understand out of it? Uh, Jawad, initially, because uh, you see the U.S. was not even a part of Kyoto Protocol initially, and then it also back out from the Paris Accord. When Joe Biden came, he bring the United States to the Paris Accord. So climate change issue, there is also controversy between the U.S. and the rest of the world regarding to how to tackle the problem of climate change. In 2018, I, I went to like Indiana Apples. There was international conference that's called GSA. I saw one scientist who was advocating that climate change is not an issue. We can adapt ourselves very easily. So there are still, there are people who believe that climate change is just, uh, we have just, uh, you know, they call the scientists who created, who, who are talking about climate change like me and others. They, they, they term us as an alarmist, basically, because they consider this not a big issue. Why they are saying this? Because to mitigate the problem of climate change, obviously, you have to cut down on the fossil fuels. And there is a big industry of fossil fuel uh, in the United States. And they also have a largest coal reserves and all those things. Similarly, just like, you know, Australia and all those things. So during this debate and all these discussion, we have wasted a lot of time. Actually, like in cutting down the fossil fuel industry. projects. So do you yeah. see any sort of progress on the part of the U.S. cutting down the fossil fuel projects? Definitely, definitely. They have to cut down and they will uh, need to find out the alternate way to, you know, to, for, to fulfill their energy needs. That's very important. Otherwise, without U.S., world cannot uh, hardly can tackle this problem uh, without the you know, cooperation of the United States and Australia. And so Dr. Asif, we like understand they, that they have to do it. But do you see it already happening on the part of the U.S.? Let me uh, bring in uh, the uh, statement given by uh, U.S. President Joe Biden during his address at the 78th session of the UNGA. Let me quote him. From day one of my administration, the U.S. has treated this crisis as an existential threat that it is not only to us, but to all of humanity. But the facts suggest, despite the warnings by the International Energy Agency, to uh, reduce uh, the global warming uh, to that limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial uh, levels, there had been a growth of fossil fuel projects, particularly in the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and Norway. So don't you think there is a huge contradiction uh, when we talk about the real ground situation as far as the US itself is concerned and the kind of statement that comes from its president uh, on such an important uh, uh, podium? Definitely the change requires some time. Obviously the statement does not match what actually you mentioned. Uh, you say that uh, US President Joe Biden said this is the problem of existence threats of the climate change. So definitely it is. But still it's a sign of a hope. At least there is now a realization in the United States and people start discussing, particularly their political leaders now start discussing other than the scientists also. So that's a sign of hope, I believe. I, 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 I can see a, some sign of a hope. But obviously, there is a lot of contradictions between their actions and their statements, obviously. And there's always a contradiction between the, you know, statements and pledges and, and actual on the ground. As I mentioned earlier, the pledges they made, the commitment they made. And I second the earlier two speakers that definitely they have to help. The, they're, they're basically there are two sets of policies, clearly. One for the developed nation like United States and UK and Australia and all those countries. And second is for those hundred countries who are likely to be suffered by the, who are suffering actually from the effect of climate change. The developed nations should mitigate their problem by reducing their own emission at any cost. There is no other choice, I believe, at this stage. We already have wasted so many times. But for the developed world, there should be strategy should be different and there should be a policies should be more focused on the adaptation side, like they, they, they should give us a money as an aid or something like that so that we can adapt ourselves to the effects of the extreme climate change because this is what they have done. But action speaks louder than words. 
So I will second you, Jawad. Uh, uh, right, uh, Dr. Mustawi, uh, phasing down the fossil fuel projects, do you see any sort of contradiction when it comes to the ground reality as far as the U.S. itself is concerned and the kind of statement that comes from its president? Oh, yes, for sure, 100%. I think one of the things that countries like Pakistan and the Global South in general, one of the things that we should prioritize at COP28 this year is, is for uh, election finance control. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the ways in which fossil fuel companies are able to avoid any kind of accountability is by funding various members of Congress during their campaigns and putting them into power and actually expecting them to vouch for them and push their interests once they are in Congress. I think that should be one of the primary targets uh, of the COP27, uh, uh, COP28 this year. Uh, alongside that, I want to I say uh, what Pakistan can do about mitigation strategy. Uh, the floods of last year, I think it's very important to note one of the, one of the failures uh, of our sort of response to those floods was that uh, there were various areas uh, that were un left unaddressed because they were, uh, there was a concentration of, um, of organizations, civil society organizations, in certain areas and not enough in others. The reason for that was that there wasn't any overseeing over uh, a, a, coordinate, a coordination body that could share information about which areas needed assistance and which areas were sort of over capacity. And this naturally has to do with the, the synergies between the National uh, Disaster Management Authority and the Provincial Level Authority. Uh, so I think it, it's, a, it's very important to create those synergies and figure out a way to sort of share information so that once these sort of disasters do happen, floods or earthquakes or whatever they may be, that we are in the position to sort of address those in a, in a, dynamic, and, and, uh, in a dynamic way that can sort of like we can sort of uh, develop our approach, change it based on real-time information that we are responding to through so correct institutions. So that naturally calls for better coordination among of the course, provincial and the federal uh, yes, tiers of, of the government. Now, uh, but the kind of uh, floods, the mm -hmm. scale of it, yeah. which we had in uh, summer 2022, it was all of sudden mm -hmm. and the record monsoon rains were so unexpected. Mm -hmm. Do you think this could have been done, a better coordination could have been done mm -hmm. within such a short span of time um, I don't think it's, it's, it's possible for that, but I think um, at the end of the day, I think it's important to adopt a long-term approach. Uh, again, I'll emphasize to institutional reform. All of these things depend on the structure of our institutions, who is leading those institutions. We need to populate our institutions with competent people. We need to make sure that they can sort of oversee people who in turn are also competent, they have experience in those domains, and we need to ensure that our institutions function in a way that um, their incentives are correct, right? So if you want to climb up the ranks within this in, uh, particular institutions, uh, there have to be clearly defined KPIs for that particular institution, whether it's the climate ministry or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or whatever the case may be. So I think it's very important to focus on that as well. Uh, on the other hand... Okay, uh, so yeah. uh, what the private, uh, Paris Climate Agreement mm -hmm. uh, basically talks about mm -hmm. it, uh, which has already been uh, mentioned by Dr. Asif also. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is uh, uh, for the major and the leading emitters to cut down the emissions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the second uh, thing is the actions which are required for building the resilience for the most vulnerable countries. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first uh, step happens to be of more importance. What's your understanding regarding that? Of course, if there is uh, mm -hmm. some sort of adverse impact of climate change happening on the most vulnerable countries, mm -hmm. they need to build up their capacity and their For resilience sure. uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change, right? Mm -hmm. But why not go and take the problem by its roots? Of course, I totally agree. I think it's important to emphasize. So there are certain like customary environmental laws globally. Uh, the, the principle known as the polluter pays principle, where, which states that whoever it is that's contributing the most amount to carbon emissions will pay in direct proportion to that. Uh, there's another rule that says that the no harm principle, which means that uh, w if, if a country is causing harm to another country across border, then they have to take responsibility for that, they have to ha be held accountable for that, and these are all established norms and laws in customary environmental law, internationally speaking. I think countries in the Global South at COP28 should emphasize this, should stress upon it, and should really not be willing to take any sort of concessions, uh, for instance, in the form of loans and so on, which only aggravate the problem like we just discussed. Right. Uh, uh, we recently saw a statement coming from the UN mm -hmm. Human Rights Chief. Mm -hmm. He said, we don't need any more warnings. Mm -hmm. We need to act now. Right. right. So. Uh, suggesting or urging mm -hmm. the leading emitters mm -hmm. to cut down their emissions, mm -hmm. is it sufficient? 
Um, of so uh, there must be a concrete it's step necessary, to start It's but uh, insufficient. I think uh, international organizations, intergovernmental bodies like the United Nations, international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and so on, they should pursue certain penalties uh, for countries that uh, exceed their fair share of carbon emissions, and they should be paying in direct proportion to that. And they should put, uh, put their foot, foot down and actually emphasize this and stress upon it and take no sort of concessions at all. Uh, I think that is very important. I think there needs to be a coordinated global effort. Uh, naturally, this ha also has to do with the st internal structure of these international financial institutions, which, which currently tend to be dominated by countries like the United States and the Western Bloc in general. Why is that? It's because they actually hold the major sort of shareholdings within these organizations. So naturally, they will uh, leverage their power within these institutions to push their sort of interests and avoid accountability. So I think there also needs to be a conversation about reforming these kinds of international financial institutions. So do you think that there is a need of having a legal mechanism having mm -hmm. a binding effect when it comes to uh, the operationalization of these agreements, like Paris Climate Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, before that we know mm -hmm. uh, Kyoto Protocol also. Yes. yes. Of course, there need to be uh, certain clearly defined legal frameworks within which countries are all operating. However, it's not enough to just have those laws. It's important for them to be implemented, for them to be uh, pursued, and for, for no country to be uh, allowed to sort of avoid accountability when they fail to meet those laws, for when, they, when they break those laws on a consistent basis, when they sort of try to justify it by saying that this is uh, in our economic benefit and so on and so forth. Uh, there needs to be a clear cut sort of like uh, an approach wh which, which does not make any sort of compromises whatsoever. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Asif, uh, what's your understanding when we talk about, you already mentioned uh, regarding uh, for the developed countries to cut down their emissions on one side and the other thing uh, is to build the resilience and the capacity of the most vulnerable countries uh, they've been impacted by the adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, so which happens out of these two to be the most important? Uh, don't you think the first one happens to the root cause and the problem should be taken by its very roots? I think so. Both strategies should work together, but uh, for me, like uh, most immediate thing is to help out this part of a nation because this part of a nation already is paying the price. If I get ill, so definitely I need medicine for that. So just like that, if Pakistan is ill just because of climate change effects, or India is ill because of just climate change effects, so first need remedies, uh, first need adaptation side, and obviously. Uh, mitigation of a problem on the developed nation side is a long-term solution for that so that the effect could be mitigated in a longer term. But for me, the both are very important and we need to prioritize. But at the same time, Jawad, it's not only the responsibility of technically advanced countries to help out in this crisis. It's all responsibility also because if we are suffering, so obviously we need to take some, you know, uh, measurable steps to combat this issue because we are suffering. They are not suffering. They, even if they are suffering, they, they, they have technical and financial resources to cope with all these type of issues uh, to, uh, to to gather the effects of climate change at the end. So obviously, this is very the, the serious efforts are needed from the technically advanced countries in the world. In the United States, particularly Java, there is a, another problem. They also uh, actually want credit for the forest they have. And their forest actually stores 300 metric ton of a carbon annually, a U.S. forest. So they says we are giving services. But if you if you go back in history of United States, obviously you 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 have come across the uh, you know documentary of uh, Al Gore, ex vice president of the United States. I must recommend that everyone must watch that documentary. His work was very much appreciated. He has created a lot of awareness in the around the in the in the masses of the world. He visited almost uh, like many countries and spread his message across. So definitely uh, the things are moving in a direction, in a positive direction, but economy plays a major role. Economy is the most important thing for United States. I believe that's why they are a bit reluctant in reducing their own emissions because obviously you have to cut on the, by, by cutting, by reducing the emission, you have to uh, lower down the industry's hour, cut down on a, and, or, you know, uh, to change into the, a renewable energy, something like that. So definitely uh, something will happen to them, their economy maybe, but anyways. So this is the important need of time. But last line is 
there is no other solution for technically advanced country to reduce their own emissions and there is no other solutions to develop this part of planet uh, this part uh, this part of a planet to help them in terms of aids in terms of providing you know help or material something like that not directly loan uh, so this is my point so 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 when we talk about the second point that has been enunciated in the paris uh, climate agreement also when it comes to finance supporting the most vulnerable countries uh, uh, regarding climate change uh, the financial support the technological support and the uh, support regarding capacity building naturally if a country is already suffering so much uh, the kind of uh, economic difficulties pakistan has had in the recent past uh, naturally, it will uh, require uh, that availability of money coming from the, uh, as a support from the leading emitters, as uh, has been described in Paris Climate Agreement. If that doesn't come, what other options do you think Pakistan might have in order to get that availability of that money? Yes, definitely. Pakistan has to generate its own resources. And we also need to improve our, you know, geopolitical situation with our neighboring countries and all those things so that we can promote the trade. We need to improve our economy. That's uh, economy is, uh, you know, very bad nowadays. So definitely, because without good economy, we cannot tackle all these problems altogether. So we need to generate funds for this from the government of Pakistan needs to prioritize the problem and uh, to put that problem as a most of the time, what happened, Jawad, this problem has been put in back burner. Since now, our uh, prime minister is in uh, New York, so definitely this problem is, you know, become a limelight of the news and media. So when he will refer back, so this problem again will go uh, go back into the back burner. So this thing should be avoided. We need to continuously discuss and talk about these issues and make the people realize that we are suffering and we have suffered already. And if we didn't, if we didn't do something at this time. Obviously, we may go to the point where there is not possible to return, point of no return. So this is the main point uh, you can say like that. Like your point is taken. Dr. Asif Javed, the environmentalist, joining us on Skype. Thank you very much for taking time out for views on news tonight. Really appreciate that. Dr. Musavi, what options, other options, if that technological support, the financial support, and the support regarding capacity building doesn't come from, Mm -hmm. uh, those countries which happen to be responsible, mm -hmm. what other options do you think Pakistan would have had, uh, would have in future to deal with this problem? I think Pakistan should focus its attention towards uh, uh, promoting democratization. I think that it should be step number one because that is what leads to our key institutions being populated by folks that can actually uh, take a comprehensive and well thought out approach to making the case that emphasizes power relations, that emphasizes the need to curtail fossil fuel emissions around the world, particularly from uh, the very few companies that uh, Rafi Saab was mentioning uh, just a while ago. There are about 10 companies or so that contribute like over 60% of emissions around the world. That needs to be emphasized in our official narrative in all of these international platforms. Uh, I think at the same time, we should focus on mitigation strategy, which this will involve energy sector reform. Uh, particularly um, uh, moving away from uh, international power producers. We have certain agreements with them that need to be renegotiated because otherwise we will continue to have a reliance upon uh, the oil and gas uh, sectors around the world because most IPPs generally base their operations around that. Uh, I think there also needs to be a conversation on our urban landscapes. We see big pollution um, on an annual basis in places like Lahore and other par parts of Punjab. I think our cities need to be restructured in a manner that disincentivizes cars um, because one of the main reasons for pollution is the number of cars on the street and so on. So uh, this can be achieved uh, through parking tolls, through, uh, through things like um, taxes on, on the use of certain roads and so on and so forth. I think that should be a very important um, aspect to our mitigation strategy in particular. Uh, this will also involve urban transit, uh, and urban transit only works well if you have a situation of high-rise buildings, high-density cities, and that should be ver very much emphasized uh, across the board in our sort of mitigation approach. Okay, how uh, one last question, sure. a quick <coughs> remark regarding that. Mm -hmm. How to tap the very potential Every year, the kind mm -hmm. of quantity that we get in form of the monsoon rains, mm -hmm. the ma uh, majority of that quantity mm -hmm. drains down yeah. to the sea. Yeah. yeah. So, so what's required to conserve that water? 
I think there are certain things that, uh, I mean, I'm not an environmental expert, so I think uh, environmental experts would know more about this, but uh, I think one of the things that we can do is to sort of look at how our national uh, disaster management authority is structured. I think that should be step number one. I think we should look at its internal incentives. I think we should establish key performance indicators for the people who are o occupying that uh, government agency. And I think that really needs to be well thought out so that our experts can sort of rise to the occasion and actually address these problems that we're facing on a regular basis uh, around the country. Dr. Abbas Musvi, Research Fellow, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, thank you very much for joining thank us you in so the much. studio. We really appreciate uh, you for taking time out for views on news tonight. Really appreciate that. And uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, today's show. Uh, I'll conclude the show with a statement that has come from uh, caretaker Prime Minister Mr. Anwar al uh, when he spoke at the SDG uh, conference that at the COP28, Pakistan would be seeking climate justice. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves. <laughs>